to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, where we just had the Remembrance Day ceremonies on Monday, November the 11th. Always a moving ceremony here in the nation's capital and ceremonies all across the country as we commemorate this year the uh, 75th anniversary of the Italian campaign, amongst other things in the uh, history of Canada's war efforts. And one of the things that I do in my career, in in addition to the show and, and my work at Parks Canada that I've talked about, is working with the Vimy Foundation. And we every year take high school students from across the country over to the Western Front to see the sites. And one of the things that we try to accomplish with these programs and these educational experiences for the students is to challenge some of the narratives that have emerged about the First World War, particularly when it comes to the stories that don't get told in Canadians' military past. And trying to demonstrate that the narratives that emerged immediately after the war and the years since, while the individual soldiers and their stories are worthwhile of being told, those that we forget or have been forgotten are, are of course, worthwhile of being told as well, which is why I'm very pleased to welcome the author of a new book entitled Harry Livingstone's Forgotten Men, Canadians, and the Chinese Labor Corps in the First World War. It's Dan Black, and he is joining me on the phone from Hamilton. Good evening, Dan. How are you? Good evening. Uh, Thanks for having me on the show, Sean. Uh, My pleasure. I'm very happy that you're here. So you have a long background in writing about Canadian military history. You were the editor of Legion magazine for a long time. You were uh, also the co-author of the book Old Enough to Fight, Canada's Boy Soldiers in the First World War and Too Young to Die, Canada's Boy Soldiers, Sailors, and Airmen in the Second World War that you wrote, John Bullough. And this book seems to be really on uh, point for you in, in your career. So I'm curious for you, how did you come to Harry Livingstone and this particular story? Well, uh, it took a little while to finally <clears throat> uh, reach uh, through the research to, to Harry Livingstone. Uh, and, and that really came about as I, as I got deep into the research and, and was able to make a connection to his son, David Livingston, who, uh, who lives down in Waterloo, Ontario. And uh, David is, uh, was uh, very generous with his father's uh, collection, uh, including letters, diaries, uh, an enormous number of photographs that, that Harry took <clears throat> excuse me, while he was with the uh, Chinese Labor Corps in China. So it was really amazing. And, and uh, you know, when you go into these things as, as an author and researcher, you're, you know, you're wondering if, if, if the person is going to be, uh, you know, very you know, generous with the files and open about it. And, uh, and David was absolutely fantastic. He, uh, after I explained what I was looking for, he, uh, he invited me down to Waterloo and I spent a wonderful full day with him going through his father's material. And he, uh, at the end of the day, he said, Dan, you please feel free to take it home with you. Take uh, take as long as you want. Uh, this is a story that I'd love to see uh, out there as well. And, uh, you know, this man is now 90 years old. And uh, one of the one of the reasons I was pushing through on the book, uh, it was about a three-and-a-half-year project, was to try to, to get it, was not the only reason, but certainly try to get it done, uh, you know, so that David could read it. And... Uh, and I might add, I, I just spent a, a week, a uh, couple of days with uh, with David, and he's in amazing, great health and good shape. So uh, he blows me away, actually. He, in fact, he's the one that drove us up to an event that we went to through a snowstorm. So that just shows you what kind of guy he is. So, uh, yeah, so Harry Livingston came sort of, you know, in the early stages of the research. But what struck me, Sean, was... While I was the editor of Legion magazine uh, several years ago, I I came across the Chinese Labor Corps, uh, heard about it, uh, didn't really understand it completely at the time, uh, 
Uh, so I commissioned uh, an Ottawa-based writer named Glenn Wright to uh, to look into it, and uh, and Glenn did this uh, marvelous piece uh, for the magazine, and uh, and you know as we're working together on the story, I was the editor, he was the writer. We're sort of going through it, and uh, it it really did hit both of us uh, that this was a story that had been forgotten and uh, certainly needed more attention as time went on, and. So when I retired from the magazine, uh, you know, around 2015, early 2015, I was uh, struck with a couple of uh, ideas to pursue, and, and uh, the Chinese Labor Corps and Canada's connection to it was the main one that I was interested in. Uh, I was at the time writing two other books, on, as you noted earlier, on underage soldiers, but this story of the Chinese Labor Corps really grabbed me, and I... I really wanted to look into it, and, uh, well, anyway, three and a half years later, this is what I've got, so, (laughs) (laughs) uh, but it is a, sorry. Well, no, anyone who's written a book uh, knows that uh, (laughs) three and a half years, that seems pretty reasonable, I have to say. (laughs) Yes, you know, like, you could always take longer on these things, of (laughs) course, but, but, you know, uh, I also, one of the other factors here, Sean, was I was trying to get it done in uh, in keeping with the 100th anniversary of the repatriation of the uh, Chinese Labor Corps. So, you know, they they started to uh, arrive in France uh, under the British in, in 19, uh, I guess 1917, early 17, and, and uh but they were there uh, until well after the armistice and uh, were the ones that were, had the, the really grisly task of uh, helping to clean up the battlefields. And uh, it was very dangerous work because they were also stumbling upon unexploded uh, ordnance. So, uh, but yeah, they didn't get to, to go back home until uh, after that work was done. And, and the very last of them were traveling back across Canada uh, in late 1919 and into early into the early ni- into early 1920. So, it, yeah. So it was an interesting story in the sense that you know why uh, why hadn't I heard about this? Uh, and here I was the editor of, of a national magazine, and you know I it just was not on the on the radar scope. Nobody seemed to be talking about it, and. And then, uh, you know, just by chance, I I heard a little bit about it and had read some articles. There had been some good articles written on the Chinese Labor Corps and on the on the Canadian connection to it back, uh, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, But it just seems to have, you know, surfaced briefly and then died away. Uh, And there have been, of course, some academic papers done on the Chinese Labor Corps back in the 1980s. Some excellent papers. but they, I just was, I just felt that there had to be a larger story here. And uh, now the un- the unfortunate part about it, Sean, was that a lot of the uh, Chinese laborers that came across Canada uh, on their way to uh, the Western Front, they they, uh, they wrote home. They wrote a lot of letters home, but uh, also many of them were semi literate or or illiterate. And and those letters that uh, those many letters that actually did reach home, Uh, there's very little left of them or uh, very little places to go to find them. There are some good, uh, good references, but, uh, but they're, they're few and far between. I would classify them as it's a fairly rare experience to be looking at anything from a laborer. So I, I had a decision to make. I thought, well, look, uh, a number of Canadians did participate in this effort. So and I'm a Canadian, and uh, I love Canadian military history, so what if we took a look at Canada's role in this and what the Canadian Canadian participants did, everything from uh, from the doctors, uh, medical corps doctors like Harry Livingston, to, to missionaries, uh, which is an interesting part of the story, uh, to others, to the CPR itself, to the uh, the railway service guard that uh, guarded the trains as the Chinese came across Canada. But I might be getting a little too far ahead of myself here. But I I was really struck by the uh, by the full scope of the story. Uh, and 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 the question always was, you know, well, why hadn't hadn't it been told uh, in depth before, like in a in a like a full book on it. So I, yeah, and, and that's the thing that I, I find really <clears throat> curious as well, because you say like if there's anyone in the country who would know about this, 
you would be sort of the prime person to to hear about these sorts of things given your background and your job with legion as the editor there and it, it strikes me as if this is something that you were unaware of or largely unaware of before uh, really coming across a lot of this material that the average canadian has very little chance of knowing about it and you know, given your experience in canadian military history like uh, what stories do get told and and there's an obvious argument that when you see the title of this book, The Chinese Labor Corps, given the experience of uh, Chinese immigrants in Canada at this time, there's a there's this sort of immediate reaction that I think a lot of people would have that say, well, of course, this story hasn't been told just given the societal realities at the time. But ha- have you noticed any trends in Canadian military history of what gets told, which stories get told and which ones don't get told? Yeah, well, I think this is obviously one that doesn't get told, and I think your your point about society, the way society was at, at the turn of the century in regards to the Chinese, that's a very good one, and that's I certainly uh, try to provide context with uh, on that in the book, because you can't just write a book on, the, on this subject without sort of trying to give the reader an understanding of what what Canada was like at the time. Now, you know, you could write chapters and chapters and chapters on that, but I was limited. But I, but I still felt it was important to provide some context on that in terms of how we treated Chinese immigration around the time that the laborers came across. Uh, although, you know, as the book says, these men were not coming in as immigrants. They were coming in, quite frankly, treated and regarded as, as so much commodity, right? They were coming in one side and out the other side. And, uh, and, and that was what it was. It was an in and out deal for Canada. They just wanted this thing to happen and get 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 these men overseas. So, but still, given that, it's interesting because there was a certain climate in Canada around this this time. And I really felt as an author uh, that I had to go in and explore that and give the reader uh, at least a, a, a semi understanding of what was going on at the time uh, uh, that this happened. As far as uh, military story, the trending of military stories go, uh, you're right. I mean, all too often, I think, uh, we pull out the tried and the true. We pull out the stories that that most Canadians, I think, are somewhat or very familiar with, you know, and you can name them. I mean, there's lots of big big stories that focus on Canada's achievements uh, uh, overseas during the war, uh, I, as when I was the editor of Legion magazine, I used to have conversations with with some uh, some of my colleagues, and it was always along the lines of, you know, we got to do more. We got to we got to try to find that other part of the story that we're that seems to be missing. And, and they're smaller stories. They're not sometimes not as romantically based, or you know what I mean. They're not. Uh, they don't uh, resonate immediately with with readers, but uh, there are stories. So many more, I believe, firmly believe. There's many more stories out there that need to be explored, and and we get, we gotta somehow be careful not to get trapped every sort of Remembrance Day, thinking about the ones that we've always been told about since we heard about them in school. Um, we have to go beyond that to get, I think, a a much uh, larger uh, appreciation for not, not only what Canada did, but just in what, what the war was in general and what it meant to human humankind. Uh, so it was, uh, I, I really do believe in that. And I, so as, as an author going forward, uh, I tend to kind of look at those unusual uh, stories or those stories that just did not get as much attention as we were used to seeing every every time, especially every time this year. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And again, one of the things we tell the, the students that we work with is that when you get into these stories, especially the ones that we haven't been told a lot, it's almost a way of humanizing this in human events and sort of putting the humanity back into it. So, so let's get into some of the specifics here. Because, as is noted in the book, not only do a lot of people not know about this in 2019, 
during the war, not a lot of people knew what was going on with this. So, uh, so, it, it, so if you could just ex- explain some of the the specifics of what's going on. So, Canada is recruiting and uh, bringing to Canada Chinese men to work both domestically and on the Western Front. Uh, no, um, I have to be careful there. Uh, what what Canada was really doing is it, it wasn't recruiting. Canada was facilitating, and it was the British Army that was recruiting the uh, Chinese labor. So, okay, so back in 1916, the, both the French and the British are, are seeing all kinds of casualties on the Western Front, and they they were bringing in laborers uh, to work behind the lines, Uh not immediately behind the lines, behind the lines. So some of them were quite a ways away from where the action was. But still, the British and the French, they needed labor over there. Uh, They had their own labor battalions uh, uh, working and pioneer battalions, of course. But but they needed non-combatant laborers to get over there. And what the British and the French both did is they <clears throat> recognized that there was a large uh, force, uh, workforce available uh, in, in northeastern China. And uh, the French uh, caught on to it first, and then the British followed. And it was the British scheme that I'm focusing on because they, they ended up recruiting uh, almost 95,000 uh, Chinese men between, roughly between the ages of 18 and 40 and not in southern China, but in northeastern China. And so, so the question was then, okay, how do, they, how do they pull them in? How do they get them in when China itself, at that time, in the early stages here, was a neutral country? And China itself had to be careful, too, because there was German representation in China, and you can imagine you know, that they had to do their best to try to keep this rather quiet. Uh, you know, and so they, the, the, anyway, so the, the British uh, were, were, they had a, a territory uh, in, in northeastern China, in Shandong province, called Weihai Wei, and uh, that is where the British initially began or established a, a, a recruitment depot for the Chinese laborers, and uh, that's where they first went. Uh, uh, they started arriving there, and and then the the British, of course, had to find a way to ship them from Wei Highway and, and another depot that was established to the south called Qingdao. And uh, so initially, they began sending them around Africa and up through the, the Mediterranean Sea. But one of the transport ships carrying CLC was uh, torpedoed and uh, tremendous loss of life. So eventually the British said, look, uh, we need to find a safer way to get them here. Uh, I'm, I'm really skipping a lot of history here, but they, what they did is they, they called on Canada and uh, they asked if they could be shipped across, uh, across uh, North America, so from Vancouver to, to the eastern ports. So, so right away, Canada says yes. This is in early uh, 1917, uh, says yes, and... Uh, and the shipments begin shortly after that. Uh, you know, you're looking at, I think, in early April of 1917, the first uh, massive ships start leaving Way High Way for, destined for, first for William Head on Vancouver Island, which was the site of a quarantine station. And so the ships stopped there. The men were medically checked there. And then from there, they went over to, to Vancouver, and then they boarded the CPR special trains that were established. Now, these trains uh, left sort of in one-hour blocks, they, and they, they, they steamed out of, out of Vancouver, and they went right across Canada, uh, although they, it's interesting, uh, they uh, did, in fact, cross into northern Maine, some of the trains, uh, actually many of the trains, and they, they crossed through uh, northern Maine, which, you know, which earlier had been an, uh, part of a neutral country, so... Uh, the men guarding them had to, uh, military men had to put civilian clothes on in order to do that. So anyway, they crossed through northern Maine and and then uh, into into no, into Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, to catch the uh, the large ships that took them over to Liverpool. 
So Canada's role was to make sure that this tr- national transportation network uh, tied to this was was maintained and under great secrecy. And of course, uh, with the war on, the War Measures Act was in, in uh, was applying, and uh, so uh, there was that. But there was also, of course, uh, at this time, a, a five hundred dollar head tax that was uh, applied to uh, Chinese immigrants when they came to Canada. So the federal government decides, uh, well, it makes sense to waive the $500 head tax for the Chinese Labor Corps. And the men board the trains, obviously, and they, they, that made perfect sense because they weren't immigrants, and but they had to waive the tax as part of it. And But they kept that secret because, obviously, they, I believe that they didn't want Canadian citizens to know that this was underway, that this tax had been waived. And... And uh, not, and also, probably more importantly, there were great security issues connected with making sure that the trains did reach their destinations uh, after all a war was on. So there were, there were a number of reasons why it was kept quiet, uh, the CLC movements. And the mo- one of the most interesting parts of, of my research involved looking at the role of Ernest J. Chambers, who was Canada's chief press censor at the time, and... Uh, now, Chambers had all kinds of responsibilities under the War Measures Act, and the Chinese Labor Corps was just one part of it in trying to keep it out of the press. But it was a tough role for him because, uh, tough job for him because it was like kind of like a, a, I likened it to a game of whack-a-mole where, where, you know, every time he thought he was keeping a lid on things, uh, something would pop up. And, uh, and most of it uh, initially was, uh, there were American papers on the West Coast that uh, suddenly were publishing photographs of these strange boatloads or shiploads of Chinese arriving on the West Coast of Canada, and and they appear to be all in uniform or in dress, you know. So, so there was all this mystery around it, and these photographs and stories were appearing, and and uh, uh, Ernest Chambers at this point is kind of like trying to appeal to the American authorities to try to prevent this from getting into the newspapers south of the border but you know good luck with that it was a it was a tough thing for him to try to do and meanwhile in canada some of the, the papers here also uh you know leaked the story and got some stuff out but uh nobody from what from my reading was was really uh had their had their feet held to the fire over it because uh chambers seemed to have a pretty good relationship with the editor so Often, more often than not, when somebody did breach something, it was more of a, a letter uh, that they would have received or a, or a, a talking to, you know. But yeah. uh, so, generally speaking, it you know the story, although it was under great, supposed to be kept under wraps. Uh, there, the veil of secrecy was there, but at the same time, it was uh, there were holes in it by the summer of 1917, uh, uh, not long after, really, that the men started coming across Canada. And uh, one of the interesting parts of the story is that there were uh, a number of Chinese laborers who, who died in Canada. Uh, uh, there are at least, I think, 30, uh, just uh, going by my memory here, but there's at least 30 that were, are, are buried at William Head, uh, the quarantine station out there. And uh, there's other, other graves right across Canada, uh, mostly single graves, but the even up in uh, at CFB Petawawa today or Garrison Petawawa, there is a single grave of a of a young Chinese man, Chu Ming Shan, who who died of of malaria on the train as it was near uh, crossing Northern Ontario near Chaplo, and uh, his body was taken off the train at Petawawa and placed in an unmarked grave. And uh, about 102 years later, uh, through partly through the research for this book and also with working with the uh, work through the uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, there was a, a headstone finally installed for Chu Ming Shan, and uh, I had the honor of being up there on October 3rd this year to uh, to watch that happen. So, so I, I I was really you know as the story and the research unfolded, and uh, you know I was really taken with how interested Canadians were in it, and. Uh, you know, when you take a stab at a topic like this, you're thinking, of, you know, maybe maybe it's not going to be of great interest. But 
yet I in pre talks that I did prior to the to the book's release, I had uh, veterans come up to me uh, at these gatherings and say, "Why have haven't we ever heard of this before?" And so there was there seems to me to be uh, a genuine interest in the topic. Yeah, I, I agree. And and you mentioned the story of Chuming Shan. You wrote a, pay, a piece for the Toronto Star about that. We'll link to that. Uh, if for anyone listening, if you go to Active History and check out the post that I'll write for this, we'll link to that story. You can also just Google uh, Dan and the uh, the the story, and that'll come up in the Toronto Star. Uh, and it's a uh, Commonwealth War Grave uh, style stone, uh, and and a really uh, there's some great photos in there of that. Uh, but in listening to this, one of the things that I'm curious about, uh, Dan, is this is a time where you know the narrative, of course, with the British Empire, it's the the empire where the sun never sets, right? They have people all yeah. over the world. Why do they yeah. need to go to J- or go to China to fulfill their labor needs? When they have this vast, I know they're, you know, using the resources across the empire during the war, but was personnel and and the people, was it that dire that they couldn't fulfill those needs from within the empire that they had to go into China to recruit people? Well, it's interesting you should say that because, and the book does explain this. Again, it's a lot of history, but. Uh, um, China originally proposed the idea of laborers to the British uh, and to the French. They they came out with an idea that that well, you know, we're a neutral country, but you know, we can help with with labor. But originally, one of the things that uh, that was set forward, and it didn't go very far. It was very quickly uh, discounted or not followed up on, was that the Chinese had actually proposed uh, armed laborers. Uh, mm-hmm. And the book talks a little bit about this. So, so your question is a very good one. But what happened was the the Chinese thought, well, uh, you know, we can send armed laborers there. And part of this, again, it's so detailed, but part of this has to do with the fact that China thought that if it contributed to the Allied war effort, that it could somehow come through the end of the war in a little better position internationally. So. Uh, you know they were looking for something in return, uh, obviously, uh, and and quite rightly so because you know quite frankly if you look at the at the history of China and how the various uh, foreign nations have established spheres of influence uh, in China, uh, you know going back after the, the Opium Wars and. But anyway, there was all that going on, and so uh, some very astute. Uh, people in China thought that that would be uh, something that we might do in order to to uh, to, uh, to to win back some of these things and perhaps not have to pay off certain things. Uh, there was a, a, a anyway. I, I can't get into all the details here, but it's interesting because they they were looking at, at trying to get something from uh, you know, from the contribution, uh, like most countries uh, were uh, looking for. But unfortunately, the Versailles Peace Conference was it was a great disappointment, and so when the war ended and uh, and the, the Chinese returned to China, they, 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 things really didn't change very much. And I get into that in the book. It's uh, also explained in the book's epilogue. So for the men who are participating, once they're recruited into this program, you mentioned the transportation side of it and, and getting to Vancouver Island and then taking the train uh, across the country. Uh, what is that? What was their experience like, and what was the Canadian perception uh, for those people who were you know, organizing this whole thing and, and facilitating on the part of the British? What was their perception of these men? Like, were they treated the same way as Canadian soldiers were when they were being transported, or uh, you know, what was the difference between uh, the, the experience that the Canadian uh, military set up for these guys versus uh, the ones who signed up in Canada. I, I, I'm really curious to know if there is a difference or if the uh, Chinese laborers were perceived differently at all by the people who were setting up this program in Canada. Well, uh, again, that's a 
<clears throat> difficult question to answer quickly. I know, but, I know, it's but, so broad, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> but it, it, but but, it, but it, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, were they treated the same way as as soldiers were treated? Uh, you know, when they boarded the trains, the answer is no. Uh, mm. Although the the soldiers still traveled on the same type of uh, car, colonist car or carriage, railway carriage. Pretty well, it was the same. They had the colonist car for the Chinese Labor Corps, not cattle cars, as some have suggested. Uh, you know, so but still, they, given the time, uh, and again, how society was viewed, uh, uh, Chinese immigration and other Im- Im- immigration from, particularly from from Southeast Asia and South Asia. And, there was this feeling of superiority, which uh, is is hard to sort of understand, but it, it certainly was there. There was this belief, I suppose, that that these men could be could be sh- uh, shipped. Uh, use the word shipped uh, rather than you know treated as as passengers. They, they, there was this sense that that the Chinese in particular could be could be jammed into the the transport ships and uh, uh, didn't need as as many I suppose considerations obviously that other steer even other steerage passengers w- would be entitled to or would receive. So it, it was a dark period. They they were uh, you know pushed along and and uh, and occasionally they were you know the canes would come out and. Uh, they would be whipped, uh, you know, in very crowded conditions on the ships. Although some of the ships is true too that some of the ships were were, uh, were retrofitted to accommodate more more men. It was still a very crowded condition crossing the North Pacific, uh, a long, long journey across there, uh, you know. And in the holds of those ships, disease would spread. And even though they did what they could to try to eliminate that possibility at the at the recruitment depots. But yeah, to answer your question, they, I don't, I, my sense is they definitely weren't treated the same way as, as, uh, as, as soldiers were. Uh, it was definitely uh, several steps down below that, I would say. Uh, you know, when, when they got, finally got on the trains, they, the cars could take about 50 uh, per car, uh, but some of those conditions were very, very crowded, uh, and they weren't, they didn't to, to eat. They they didn't just go to the commissary car and grab their food and come back. What happened was they would they would designate a party of you know half a dozen men to go to the commissary car and they would come back with the rations and uh, uh, and then they would the Chinese themselves would prepare the rations in their in their colonist car. Meanwhile, you know, supervising the trains were were uh, British and Canadian. Uh, officers uh, and the trains were also guarded uh, by members of the railway service guard which is another fascinating aspect of Canadian military history I and mean, who's ever heard of the railway service guard but they they weren't they weren't the railway service guard wasn't the CPR the railway service guard was a, was an actual military unit um, and uh, they tended to pick men that were um, not sometimes in the best of health. They were men that were older, older. Although there were some young guys that mixed in there, including one young guy uh, who uh, who died not long after joining the RS uh, Railway Service Guard. But so these guys were 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 were, were uh, uh, you know not necessarily. Uh, destined for the Western Front as fighting men, they were men that that here's something that they, that they could do. And there were were some men that actually were over on the Western Front that when their once their age was found out, they were sent home and they became at least one or two of them I know became members of the Railway Service Guard. So that's an interesting part of the story because they were Canadians and they they you know sat on these trains armed uh, with they were in uniform and they. One guard was positioned at the front and back of every car, and uh, it was a long, tedious journey. And they crossed the country with, and their job was to make sure none of the uh, the Chinese laborers would escape off the trains. Um, and that's an interesting, whole other interesting conversation mm-hmm. around whether they would even be interested in doing that or not. But, but the railway service guard. Uh, they, some of them paid a serious price because uh, they would cross to Halifax, and then they would deadhead back to Vancouver Island, uh, 
and there was one very serious train uh, accident that occurred near uh, Dorval, uh, and a number of these guys were killed and injured. So, but whoever who's ever heard of that? And you know, when they, but you know, they were doing their bit for the war effort. Uh, but uh, it's one, again one of those stories. It's just not not pursued very often. Mm-hmm. And so for the uh, the men themselves, once they they like. Is part of the way they're treated based on what they're going to do once they get to Europe, right? It, it, you know, it says here that you know they're they're being recruited to dig trenches and snack ammunition, yeah. haul supplies. Yeah. Right? Are they seen as lesser than because they're not intended to go to the front lines? and therefore can be treated in a different way as a result. In addition to the other social stuff that's going on, within the context of war, they're not the ones on that front line. So is, does that influence the way they're seen? Yeah, I, I don't really like talking in, in generalities, but, I, but sure. I know what you're, you're asking yeah. me about, and I, I appreciate the question. Uh, it's just that what happens is, um, yeah, I mean, I yes, I would think that that most definitely happened, that they had a role that wasn't as, you know, as engaging as some, some of the roles were connected with, with war military service. And these guys were the, the, the blue collar, uh, uh, guys working, uh, behind the lines uh, they were doing, some of them were doing very, uh, man, obviously it was all under man, very manual labor, but some of the tasks were, were quite menial. I mean, they were doing things like emptying latrines. They were, uh, not just digging trenches or digging, uh, ma- fixing roads and, and repairing things. They were doing a lot of the maintenance work. They were cooks, uh, you know, uh, but it was overall, it could be very dangerous work, uh, in behind the lines. And, and, uh, but yeah, so I think definitely, uh, so some officers in particular definitely could easily look down their noses at, at these men in, in terms of what their station in life was and that so beyond the actual work there was also this class system right there was this class system going on and and uh, British officers Canadian officers could uh, very easily look at these men as, as not being equivalent to them in terms of number one where they came from but also the type of work they were doing mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, no, and, and I think that's I think that's a really fair and, and a good point to say that you know it's it's not fair to talk in generalities because you know we're talking about what eighty five thousand people, right? Uh, approximately. Well, there were nine, yeah, there were ninety five, uh, Sean, that okay. came across. Uh, sorry, ninety five thousand that the British uh, enrolled in the Chinese Labor Corps, and about eighty one thousand of them crossed Canada. Right. Uh, that's ba- based on the, what I could find. Uh, another three thousand. 500 or 2,600 boarded the Empress of Asia on the West Coast, and they went down through the Panama Canal and up, you know, New York to New York, and then across the North Atlantic. So, you know, uh, the numbers that I I'm sticking with seem to are, are borne out by the uh, by the medical uh, superintendent's reports at the quarantine station on at William Head. Uh, I went through all the annual reports there the, the, that were produced by, uh, by the medical and superintendent, and, and he and he gave numbers. And I think his his final number came out to to about eighty four thousand plus that uh, that went through William Head. Uh, but I couldn't find evidence of all of those men actually getting on the trains. Uh, I'm not saying that 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 they didn't, but it seems to me that if his final number was about 84,000 plus, uh, it makes sense that, and then I do know that approximately 3,500 got on the Asia. It makes sense that about 81,000, 82,000 crossed Canada. So, um, you know, it was a massive undertaking and, uh, the Canadian public by and large had no idea it was going on. And, um, and it was a story that remained really unknown for for years, for decades after. And uh, so it's um, yeah, yeah, it's incredible, right? That you're talking about 
you know, <laughs> nearly a hundred thousand people, and, uh, and and the public doesn't know that this is going on, sort of in the midst of the war, and and these trains are going through communities across the country, and people are just unaware of it. And, and as you say, you know, you mentioned Chambers, uh, the press sen- censor. I mean, it, it speaks to an effective job on on his part certainly and the media in general but but also how things in not only in a war setting but just in general can really be hidden in plain sight well yeah one of the things that blew me away was the uh you know and it, uh, another author had sort of pointed to this uh, it was more of an international book on the clc uh and I, I looked into it, and it was uh, a, a train derailment that occurred in northeastern Ontario. One of the uh, CLC specials went off the track, and uh, there were four cars that tumbled into a very, very deep uh, snow f- uh, field with snow. It had just snowed, actually, and and uh, there was a lot of snow. And the, the, thank goodness, because the uh, the Collins cars kind of careened off and rolled into this field, and. And when the men emerged from the cars, they were still wearing the slippers that they put on their feet in uh, in northeastern China when they boarded the ships. They didn't get uh, they didn't get uh, boots until they reached France. Wow, it's quite, it's quite remarkable. And so you know they're wading through this waist high snow to get back onto the train parts of the train that did not derail the front part of the train, I guess. And and you know, I just can't, I can't, I can't imagine it. And it was in January, so they're you know, cold and uh, not perhaps as cold as it could get up up in northern Ontario, northeastern Ontario. But it, it was certainly not a nice day. Um, anyway, they, so they, yeah, they, they, nobody was killed outright in the in the accident, but there were a couple of men on that train that succumbed later, uh, although the. British officer was conducting that uh, that contingent. He wrote in his report that it wasn't that their deaths weren't due to the accident; it was, they were due to illness. But but you have to wonder. Um, yeah, you really uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you're put out in the snow with no shoes, yeah. and no shoes. then you die. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I could see a connection between those two events. I, I you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should just point out, you know, and I, you introduced me earlier as sort of the, the retired or former editor of Legion magazine. I, I wanted to sort of just add a little bit of a qualif- qualification there, and that is, is that I'm not a, I'm definitely not an, a, an historian per se. I, I don't I suggest for a second that I am. I'm just a retired journalist who, who uh, saw this as an interesting bit of history and, and went after it and. Uh, um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I'm, I'm not a trained historian. I'm a, I'm an academic, or I'm a, I'm a journalist. So, well, I mean, sometimes you know, <laughs> journalists can actually be better historians than historians sometimes. So, especially in a story like this, I, I think that's valuable because, you know, hi- historians, you know, our training is to, you know, follow the the trail and and certainly i guess journalists do that but but journalists are also really good at uncovering things right and you know figuring out what what stones need to be overturned and and maybe having just a different perspective on on tracking down stories and following through on leads and stuff so i think that's a really good uh, really good background for this particular story and as you said sort of the challenges of the sources here that you know, the letters from the men themselves are kind of limited and, and tough to find. You know, having that ability to, you know, maybe think outside the box of what historians perhaps are trained to do. You know, th- there's value in that in trying to uncover these these hidden stories or these forgotten stories. Yeah, well, yeah, I look at it as a starting point, really, because uh, you know, even today, I got an email. Uh, from a, a fellow who heard me on the, on the current uh, the other day and uh, yesterday I guess and and uh, he explained that his his grandfather was uh, an, a doctor that uh, traveled with the Chinese Labor Corps and I know when I was researching that particular fellow uh, 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 for the book I couldn't find a lot of information on him I found a little bit but. 
and included, you know, what I, I could. But what I found extraordinary is he writing me today and he's saying that he has all these letters. And uh, and so, you know, you, you write a book like this, and I guess one of the, the good things with it is it uh, can lead to more more exposure on the topic. And uh, so I, I intend to meet with that fellow uh, uh, next week and, uh, and just sort of take a look at the letters at least. But it's, it's yeah, you, you kind of like sort of, oh, I wish I'd known you <laughs> two years ago. And because uh, that could have been, uh, it could have added a lot more, more to it. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's one of the one things that you sort of you go through. You can't regret it, but at the same no. time you go through and you think, wow, gee, you know, when a book comes like <laughs> comes out, it's suddenly now people are aware of the topic and and you and you get to hear from them. So it's a it's a it's a marvelous thing, I suppose. Yeah, that'll be good for you know volume <laughs> two, right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe the, sec- yeah. the second edition. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so so I, I just want to finish with this uh, this question too. If, for you in researching, particularly this story, but you know, the, also the uh, the other stories that you've done with the, the some of the underage soldiers, when we learn more about these forgotten stories in Canadian military history, how do you think it influences Canadians' understanding of the First World War, and how, if at all, should it influence the uh, stories that get told and or, or particularly in some of these uh, ceremonies that take place on November the 11th like how do we integrate these stories into the established narratives that tend to get repeated around the 11th uh, and, and how do you think that Canadians can better incorporate that into their memory of the first world war well, I think it's through shows like yours, uh, because you take the time to interview, you know, people like me, and and you you uh, you're aware, uh, you're conscious of the fact that it, it it's a multi-layered uh, uh, history, and you know uh, how do we get that out there further? Well, that's that's been the big question. I mean, uh, when I was at Legion Magazine, I was always looking for you know, the extraordinary, if you know what I mean. I'm not, mm-hmm. not looking for, you know, sensational, but just looking for those other stories. Uh, and I would often look at, try to, uh, you know, do the research and find what those stories were. Uh, as far as improving Canadians' understanding of the scope of our military history or our history in general, I mean, that's, uh, I'm afraid it's up to, to, to choice, uh, there's uh, you know there's so many books out there now, and so many other uh, things that I think serve as distractions around um, around our history. Uh, I think you know there there I don't know if a greater effort. I don't want to sort of kind of pontificate about you know what our education system is doing because I think they are doing a, a, an excellent job. Uh, but how do you how do you lead people into reading uh, about things that are a little off the beaten path from what they have long been told is in their military history or history? Uh, um, it's yeah, it, it's a tough one. I mean, uh, you, you just have to hope that people have the curiosity uh, to want to go. Um, uh, on a diff- not I'm not saying go deeper at any 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 means because I think much of the history that we do have out there is very deep and very important, obviously. But how do you get people to sort of take a little branch offshoot here and there to look at other aspects of it? Uh, uh, I, I know that when when we come up with topics like this and in, in books like this, I, I, I can I can tell you, Simon, the only thing I I'm usually met with is absolute surprise that people didn't know about it and they wanted to, they want to know about uh, a little bit more about it and uh, so and that that I'm very grateful for that uh, you know if you're, you're coming up with a topic and you're you're telling people about it and there's just no response then that's a different matter maybe you're kind of chasing the wrong thing but with something like this or something that uh, sounds off the top a little unusual a little surprising 
uh, once it's out there and eventually shared more often, then it becomes part of that wider understanding of what happened during during the war. And you know, I, my hope it's my small hope here that when, once this book is out there, that uh, at least people who read it will have an understanding that that Canada did have a role in this massive international effort to uh, to bring these men over to war torn France and Belgium and. And uh, it's it's it's, it's uh, certainly a role that's been largely forgotten, not completely, but largely forgotten. And and it's one of those things that might people might you know next next time they're thinking about the war, oh yeah, you know we also did that. And I, I'm not saying that that the Chinese labor corps changed the outcome of the war. I don't pretend to do that at all in the book. I but I do try to make the point that their arrival. Uh, their very timely arrival in in France uh, in Belgium came at an incredibly important time. It was a very crucial moment in the war. Uh, so if they hadn't arrived there, you know, what would have that meant? Um, but I'm not su- suggesting for a second that it would have changed the outcome of the war. I don't believe that. But but it certainly was needed at the time. And uh, but your your you know question about our understanding how you know does it how do we change the understanding our understanding of the war and and how does how do books like this perhaps influence as you know as we move forward in in that understanding uh, that's a tough one i mean it's one of those things where you know if people are have a natural interest in it they will they will read read stories like this and they will come away hopefully with a slightly larger perspective on, on what our contribution was so I don't know if that answers your question no, no I, I think it's a really a really good answer as you say it's it's about you know, ha- telling the stories getting the stories out there and and finding that audience and the people who are interested in the war already will enjoy this different perspective and people who might not have that existing interest having different stories to tell could be that hook in so uh, yeah just the more we tell the stories the better you know you you, you got to imagine that here's harry livingston a uh, small town doctor in listowel ontario and he's 28 years old when he decides in 1916 to head down to london ontario uh, where he joins the canadian army medical corps uh well-known young man growing up in Listowel, uh, got good marks in school, had already gone away to University of Toronto where he became a, a, a doctor, a physician. And he returns back home, and because he's a homebody, he returns back home and opens up a practice above his father's drugstore. And then, as I said, by 1916, he's in London, and he's getting on a train. But he's not going to France. He's not going to Halifax. He's not going to France. You know, he's going the other way. He's going uh-huh. to China. So I was absolutely struck by this idea that there he was, uh, sitting at Union Station, waiting to get on a train. And you can imagine, you know, at one point he goes, his his father comes down and meets him for lunch, and they he, he takes the, he and his traveling companions over to the Walker House, which had a big restaurant in it, and they're all sitting there in their uniforms, uh, save for Harry's father, and if you were in that dining hall, you would have got the immediate impression that these men were bound for France or were home on leave or something, but no, they were going to China. Yeah. And, and it just, like, yeah, you, know, it, you just wouldn't expect it. Yeah. And, and nobody would have. And, and so yeah, that, that, that kind of blew me away when I, when you think about all the attention that was focused on Western Europe, of course, at the time, but, here was a situation where a Canadian, three Canadians were en route to China. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and again, those are the sorts of stories that we, we need to tell. And that that's why I'm so glad that this book exists, that this story is finally being told. And, and as you said, you, you were there for the uh, ceremony where they, they put up the stone to uh, Chu Ming Shan. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yep, Chu Ming Chan, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, and and that sort of recognition of what happened then is is finally slowly starting to take place. You know, we talk all the time about 
the first world war is this total war and everybody being involved and yet we don't tell all the stories so it's so great that uh, you're there finding all this information and and helping to tell these stories it's it's just phenomenal well i'm glad to be a little bit of help on this front and uh it's and really that's you know yeah it's it's just i'm just doing my bit and i know that as time goes on, uh, you know, even this story could be uh, uh, expanded upon for sure, and I would welcome that. But there's a lot, always a lot more information, and I don't look at history as a as a one-off thing on any particular topic. It's something that has to keep flowing forward, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the topic is. There's always something new to add to it. Yeah, absolutely. So for anyone who finds anything or knows more about this story, uh, the first thing, of course, go get the book, Harry Livingston's Forgotten Men, Canadians and the Chinese Labor Corps in the First World War. And if you have information, as Dan says, he is open to it and, and continue to contribute to this story and have more people know. So uh, Dan Black, uh, author of this book, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It has been a pleasure. Sean, I really appreciate the time, and, and good luck with your show. If you have any questions or comments for the show, you can find us at HistorySlam at gmail.com. I am at Dr. Shawnee Fever on Twitter. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show on Google Play, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your show. Give us the likes, ratings, all that fun stuff to keep the show going. And we'll be back in a couple weeks with a new episode. But until then... If you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.